the Bering Sea shore of St. Lawrence Island. Before there were borders in the Arctic, two and a half thousand years ago, the forebearers of Yupik Eskimos settled here, a life bound to this sea, gathering from these fertile waters the means to survive. A balance of hunter and quarry, the Eskimos honoring every living thing with an Inua or Dagadak, a spirit to respect the animals that gave the Eskimos life. Long before the white man and his borders arrived, the Bering Sea belonged to the Eskimo. They traveled freely across the sea to visit family and friends living on the coast of what would later become Siberia. Every summer for centuries, yearly visits were made back and forth in walrus skin boats, a time of trading and celebration and friendly competitions. Every time the people from Siberia comes, everybody was so excited because some of them are relatives. The 20th century brought war to the Arctic. When it was over, nothing would be the same. With peace came a new war, a cold war, a U.S.-Soviet battle in which no shots were fired, an atmosphere of tension, fear, and suspicion. The question is, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? Soviet Russia was expensively stabbing westward. The ideological battleground was in Europe, the line drawn over what would become the Iron Curtain. In the Arctic, the Soviet-American border would remain open until May 29, 1948, when the Soviets ordered the border closed. The U.S. responded soon after, shutting down the American side. An ice curtain had cut the Bering Sea in half, dividing a people. That was just sad. We, we don't see e each other anymore. Ora Galagergen is a Yupik elder living in Savunga, St. Lawrence Island. A few years before the border was closed, at the age of 24, she went along on what was to be the last visit to Siberia by the natives of St. Lawrence. I miss them. I, I'm still missing them. Good times. An April afternoon on Kachemak Bay, just off Homer, Dr. David Lewis has sailed more than 100,000 miles in his 70 years. He is the captain of the 70-foot Hawaiian Tropic Cyrano, one of the last trading schooners built in the Caribbean. Conservative columnist and sailor William F. Buckley Jr. once owned the Cyrano. He used it for charters. But now the schooner is an instrument of detente, a sailing platform for the Bering Straits expedition. Dr. Lewis and his wife, fellow researcher Dr. Mimi George, want to study Arctic native peoples on both sides of the border, how they hunt and navigate in the unforgiving Bering Sea. The voice of the traditions of the Arctic is still here in the old people, and it's, um, I think the whole world has a lot to learn from here, and I, I want to be a part of it. We're trying to represent a, uh, uh, the building of cooperation and friendship between the two superpowers and uh, on a grassroots people level. To inaugurate their expedition, the team proposes a reunion of St. Lawrence Island and Siberian Eskimos, a voyage to the Siberian village of New Chaplino, using the traditional method of travel by sea. By midsummer, the Cyrano is based off the Yupik village of Gamble on St. Lawrence Island. On a clear day here, the Siberian coast appears as a mountain range on the horizon. Siberia, just 38 miles away, one day's sail. The Yupik children of Gamble only know through the stories of the elders the visits that were once made to Eskimo villages on the other side. The other thing is, uh, the really big thing is uh, making arrangements for immigration and customs. Dr. George calls a meeting in the Gamble City Hall for the Yupiks signed up to sail on the Cyrano to Siberia. Where were you sent? 
Some are old enough to remember the visits, some are not. All are bound by a heritage that's calling them back across the Bering Sea. But this chance at a reunion is frustrated. The group must first get Soviet approval, and it's not happening. It is very urgent. We have great difficulty waiting any longer. Who dealt those cards? After a three-week delay, the Cyrano crew is running out of time. Three crew members have already left. If the visas don't come soon, the now mild Bering Sea will become too dangerous to cross. Finally, a breakthrough. Visas for Siberia are now being written in San Francisco. All the red tape has been complied with, and the Serrano Siberian bus should be sailing for Novichaplino and Providenia tomorrow afternoon. The Bering Air flight from Nome brings the visas, the last leg of a 3,000 mile journey from the Soviet consulate in San Francisco. Yeah. We got it! Yeah. The Cyrano's voyage starts here on Gamble's gravel shore. I don't know. I said I don't believe it yet until we get there. God, that's America. Run down to people on the safety things. Yeah. yeah. Course for Providenia 290. <laughs> Bureaucrats on both sides, I think, have stretched their rules a little bit to fit in, which is really a very big thing. <laughs> a major milestone in my life. It just sort of brings to my mind, it focuses in on how they must have felt. Uh, anticipation of seeing relatives. The conditions are perfect. The Siberian coastline off Cyrano's bow. Sailing time, 14 hours. In about four hours, in about four hours, two o'clock a.m. your time. A Soviet tugboat meets the Cyrano a couple miles out of Providenia, the port of entry. You are the captain? Yes. Glad to see you. You are Dr. Lewis? Yes, right. Hello. Hello. Immigrations good. officials board to check visas, and the Cyrano is allowed to enter the port without a hitch. The Cyrano ties up in Providenia overnight, this frontier town of 5,000 people, a maintenance port for Soviet icebreakers. This is the setting for the first reunion. His clan came uh, from St. Lawrence Island. Long time ago. <laughs> Sharing the same Yupik dialect, Gamble's Nancy Wolunga finds a Siberian Eskimo related to her own great grandfather. Uh, each villager tries to find their own connection in this chance meeting on the streets of Providenia. Later, the official welcome. Gamble's Gerard Kanuka finds his Siberian cousin Nanook, Eskimo for polar bear. But the real destination is about 10 miles away. A caravan rides to New Chaplino, where most of Gamble's relatives live. <laughs> Nancy Wolunga and her daughter Wendy, two generations reunited with Siberian relatives. <laughs> <laughs> Meantime, Gamble's 66-year-old Grace Sloco ventures out in the village. 
she is a faith healer back home, and while others ride three wheelers there, she still walks. In New Chaplino, she finds her cousin. Many years ago, we know each other. Yeah. When we were girls. And while they share the same language and ancestry, the natives of Gamble find the years of separation and control by different governments have brought changes to the lives of their relatives. This is not the place they used to visit. This village was built just 30 years ago. Concrete apartments now provide the shelter. New ones cost around $400,000 to build here, but rent is only about $20 a month. Lilia and Lita earn about $300 a month in this reindeer hide factory. They prepare and sew the hides for coats, boots, and handbags. This is the end of a process that starts with the Yupiks herding reindeer on a collective farm on the tundra. In a new Chaplino apartment, T provides a break from the working world. Tanya is a store clerk, Antonia a teacher, Lena sews for a living. Valya and Natasha play on their school's basketball team. In an interview arranged with a Soviet interpreter, they say they are content in New Chaplino and proud of their way of life, but they admit moving from old Chaplino was hard. For these Yupiks, it is a lifestyle created by a government thousands of miles away, for a people who've lived here for thousands of years. A walrus camp, 10 miles north of New Chaplino. In mid-evening, the sled dogs and their Yupik masters wait for the return of the hunters. This is a collective camp. The walrus ivory is sent away to be carved in another village. And most of the meat, a traditional staple in the Yupik diet, ends up here as feed for blue foxes, a fur farm started by the Soviets as a new industry for the Yupiks. Uh, Eager was uh, brought into this area to hunt, help uh, hunt walrus from a very early age when he was a young boy. Back over at Gamble, we uh, mainly do it for our own, you know, each individual boat or each individual person or a crew. Uh, here, the difference is uh, they do it for, uh, for the uh, system, more or less. <laughs> But despite these changes in a common culture, it is the heart of this Soviet village that now celebrates in reunion. This is all the Yupiks of Gamble and Siberia have wanted, a chance to share what they have shared for thousands of years. And in this moment on the streets of New Chaplino, they have found each other again. The visit lasts five days. Eskimos used to stay as much as a year or more. My favorite girl. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. In this farewell, there is promise, invitations to return, through the ice curtain for another Eskimo reunion.
Ah, boy. All my life, as even a little girl, I used to look down that way and under the sitting sun, Siberian mountains are down there. I could almost draw them sometimes. I could think to memorize them and uh, draw them, but haven't yet. But there they are, just like that. Now we're writing them. Thank you for bringing us here.